Welcome to Christ the Center, your weekly conversation of Reformed Theology. I believe this is episode 716. Uh, my name is Camden Busey. I'm here in Grays Lake, Illinois. Uh, if you're watching the video, you'll see we have a little bit different of a setup um, on the side table. And I have with me here in studio, Ryan Noah, serves as a executive assistant here at Reform Forum and helps a tremendous amount with Reformed Academy. Welcome, Ryan. It's good to see you. Thank you, Camden. Good to be in studio and in yes. studio with you, because normally when I'm in studio, you're out of town doing <laughs> the work of the evangelist, uh, even out of the country. So uh, it's a pleasure. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to be back. It's been uh, been back for a couple of weeks now, but as you heard in the last episode, we, um, well, Doug Clawson and I were out of the country. We were in Columbia doing some work uh, through OPC Foreign Missions, and I was teaching two courses there. Uh, in different cities, one on um, Roman Catholicism and uh, looking at uh, the Reformation, Roman Catholicism and the Reformation today, kind of looking at the history, but then also comparing and contrasting the theology of post-Vatican II Roman Catholicism with that of, um, you know, confessional Reformed Orthodoxy. And then the second course I taught was on uh, Lamentations, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, um, and that's based on a Bible study book I wrote with Crossway. I think I'm out of copies of that here, so I need to reorder that so that yeah, we, we have them in the store. Uh, but uh, if you'd like to hear a little bit of the material from the Roman Catholicism course, you can find that on uh, episode 715. And uh, Jim Cassidy and I discussed that and talked a bit about the effects of modernism on Roman Catholicism and American Presbyterianism, because there are some parallel tracks there. So if you're interested in hearing, you know, from the 18, 1879 in Catholicism, leading all the way up to eventually what happened in 1962 to 1965, it's it's interesting, I think, as an historian, just to compare mm-hmm. these parallel tracks and see how modernism impacted both churches and uh, what the churches did about it. Just the short thesis, uh, Catholicism kind of solved, solved the problem of modernism uh, with Vatican II, which some people, you know, see the imprint of Karl Rahner and the New Theology and other folks there large on that. It basically uh, almost kind of universalized Catholicism in terms mm-hmm. of its the church's relationship to the world. And then uh, mainline American pr- uh, Presbyterianism at least solved the problem of modernism by turning to Bart, and we see the effects of that in the Confession of 1967. Uh, but today we're not going to be talking about uh, Catholicism directly. We'll come back around to that uh, at the Reform Forum Conference. I'm working on a lecture uh, on 20th century Catholicism and uh, nature and grace and how that relates to the deeper Protestant conception as expounded by Gerhardus Voss. Our subject matter for that conference is the Covenant of Works. So if you're interested in attending, uh, visit us online at reformedforum.org slash conference for information. We're down in Pflugerville, Texas, which is just outside of Austin. Should be a wonderful time. Uh, But we've got big, big news this week. Uh, As this episode uh, is released on uh, September 17th, 2021, uh, we will be releasing a new course on Reformed Academy, a course taught by Lane Tipton entitled Union with Christ, the Benefits of His Suffering and glory. So we're going to drop that course. We've been working on it for quite some time. I think five months ago was or thereabouts when Lane recorded it here in studio and uh, took me uh, long enough to um, to uh, edit it and get it all ready video wise. But mm-hmm. uh, Ryan, why don't you tell us what we've been doing sure. and uh, where this course is, the work that you've done over the last couple of weeks and the, the yeah. people that have been helping with it. And then we'll situate this course within the larger context of Reformed Academy and perhaps talk about that and the future of our of our initiatives there. Sure. Yeah, well, this course, uh, Union with Christ, the, the Benefits of His Suffering and Glory, is all about uh, redemption accomplished and applied. And it takes its, it takes its, its pedagogical uh, jumping off or starting point with question and answer 30 of the Westminster Shorter Catechism, all about how, uh, how the Spirit applies to us the redemption purchased by Christ. And he applies the redemption purchased by Christ by working faith in us and uniting us to Christ in effectual calling. And so the course is 10 lessons, and it, it begins with redemption accomplished and then ends with uh, redemption applied by the Spirit and that faith union with Christ and unpacks um, how we receive all the benefits of, of Christ's work namely his uh, uh, justification and sanctification and adoption and all the, 
all the benefits that, that accompany and, and flow from those. And over the past few weeks, uh, what I've been doing is building the course in our Reformed Academy. Uh, so I've, I've been making the quizzes, yeah. watching the lectures, and, and you know, looking for, for questions that will um, be geared towards comprehension so that you can track with us and make sure you're understanding the material. Um, and also helping folks to stay on the rails, you know, because there are certain things that we, we especially want to guard against theologically mm. and want to make sure that our students um, have the proper knowledge about. So that's what I've been doing. And um, I've been working also already with uh, some of our, our friends that speak other languages mm-hmm. and uh, are helping us to correct and uh, review and edit the subtitles that we've already had done yeah. uh, in Spanish and we also have in Simplified Chinese. Mm-hmm. And so we're, we're just thrilled about that. Yeah, those are a big emphases at the moment, not only getting as many courses recorded on specific and important topics that are undertreated or underserved in the community. Uh, we, we realize there are a lot of reformed groups that produce educational material. We love that. We don't want to compete. Uh, mm-hmm. We don't view it that way at all. But we're looking at our specific strengths and abilities and opportunities and trying to develop courses that fit those gaps, that, that fill the hole, so to speak. And so this is a unique course, Union with Christ, the benefits of his suffering and glory. It's very uh, Reformed Forum-esque insofar right. as we follow in the in the tradition of Voss and Van Til and um, the redemptive historical theologians such as Voss, Klein, Gaff, and, and you know, that whole strand. That's what we do. You know, if, if, if you've been hanging around uh, Reform Forum for any amount of time, you know, that's our that's our thing. Mm-hmm. And um, so we're trying to contribute in a way that is in accord with our strengths and uh, also in accord with our, our great desire to present every person mature in Christ. But we view the way to do um, that the church is able to do what Paul says in Colossians 128 is specifically through uh, an inculcation and cultivation of the mindset of the deeper Protestant conception, something that Voss talked about. It's understanding that man is created in natural religious fellowship with God and with um, the the promise of moving beyond the state in which he was created in in innocency, which was very good, but moving unto a consummate state of glory and uh, beatific vision. In, in the new heavens and the new earth. That is critical. So mm-hmm. we're everything we're doing is trying to push toward that main right. thesis, that main vision, that understanding of the Christian life as we're pilgrims now moving through the wilderness toward that final end, which is achieved now after the fall into sin only through the person, the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So uh, this course is all about that, how we are united to that Christ who secures that salvation for us and brings us to, in antis- he's already accomplished it, but now uh, the application of that salvation is being worked out in us by the Spirit. This is the course, um, it, it's available now uh, as as you're listening to this uh, on reformedforum.org. And before we talk more specifically about the the, um, the specifics of Reformed Academy, which is a portion of the of the website, all at reformedforum.org, um, we do have also some updates. Some of you have been getting emails about this course, uh, Foundations of Covenant Theology, also by Lane Tipton. This is a wonderful book. on uh, It's a biblical theological study of Genesis 1 through 3. You may remember years ago, just a few years ago, we had a special seminar down in Wimberley, Texas. And Lane taught this material, and we recorded it, uh, and it turned out excellently. And uh, we formulated and fashioned that into a course that is now also available on Reformed Academy for free. You can watch, you can sign up for a free account, and you can take the course, and it'll track your progress and everything all entirely for free, other than the exchange of an email address. You don't even have to give us a real one. We want you to give us a real email address. But if you're really private and don't want us to know who you are, whatever, you can give us a fake one and it'll still work. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yeah. You don't have to send us a scan of your driver's license or anything like that. So we uh, 
after a while, we're able to formulate all of the lecture material and to uh, have it edited and produced into this wonderful little paperback book. Uh, we've sold, I don't know, 800 of these so far. That's right. Um, now, we also have this, which is a little USB thumb drive, USB 3. I paid, we paid extra to get a really fast one. These are 64 gigabytes. Um, they, they come and they're less than half full, but you're getting all the videos uh, in HD. They look great. They have good audio. Uh, we have accompanying MP3 files. So if you just want the audio and want to load that up on an iPod or something like, or do people have iPods anymore on, a, on your phone or burn them off to CD and take them with you uh, and listen to them in your car, or whatever, then you can do that. We also have the subtitle files, which are just specially formatted text files. So if you're using a, a player like VLC media player, which I use on Mac, or you can get it on Windows, it's open source. When you open a video file, you can point it to a corresponding subtitle file. And we have all the subtitles, uh, captions in English, but then the subtitles in um, Spanish and uh, simplified Chinese. So you can uh, follow along in another language there, as well as the PDF handouts. Mm -hmm. All of that is preloaded onto a USB drive. So if you're interested in this course, you can now buy the book on its own, you can buy the USB drive on its own. You could buy the two together in a bundle and save a few dollars on our website. Or what I recommend, you can buy the all-in-one course pack, which has 10 copies of the paperback book and a copy uh, of the one USB drive with the whole course preloaded onto it. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is kind of a, a, a plan for us moving forward where our goal is to record a course, to make it available for free on Reformed Academy to anyone around the world, to get it translated into as many languages as possible and feasible and that makes sense, you know, as many speakers and that we have relationships with people in foreign mission fields who speak that language. Then to have a companion book that is tailored toward not only the individual reader, but would have discussion questions and would be formatted in a way that would be useful for adult Sunday school or study groups. And then also to have, you know, USB drives to make it even easier for people to lead a group that's going through this particular mm. course. So this is the first kind of complete package of what we pray will be many, many to come. So we have six courses in Reformed Academy. Uh, I think this is the sixth complete one, and then there's a seventh coming, or is it the fifth complete one, and then the sixth coming? This is a, uh, we have one in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. We, yeah, we have Westminster Shorter Catechism, two on covenant theology, um, and then we have, oh man. Uh, Van Til. Yeah, the Van Til's, uh, two courses on Van Til. So we have five. This will be the sixth. And then, uh, Lord willing, I know we have our conference coming up and a lot going yeah. on, but Lord willing, we'll have the completed Westminster Shorter Catechism course. So it's really well. not another right course. It's, it's just the com the completion of an already existing. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Because right now we that's just right. have questions one through thirty eight, mm -hmm. which which incidentally or providentially would be great to study as a, a complement to Doctor Tipton's Lane, uh, Doctor Tipton's uh, Union with Christ course. Yes. In that there's really a catechetical design built into the Union with Christ course that that begins with question twenty three about how Christ executes the offices of, mm -hmm. you know, prophet, priest, and king in the estate of humiliation and exaltation, and goes all the way up to the benefits that we receive from Christ uh, when we pass into glory, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so that'd be a, a terrific course to uh, to look at hand in hand, you know, when, when he opens up question 30, see what Dr. Cassidy says about it in, in his course. Yes. And ch also check out some of the resources that we've recommended in yes. Reformed Academy as, as supplements, whether it's Williamson or Right. Or Voss, et cetera. That's great. That's great. Um, one more reminder, we're going to put uh, the final lecture for this course at the end of this episode. Uh, we've already included the first lecture of this course in a previous episode of Christ the Center a few weeks ago. I'll put a link to that in the episode description as well. But just a reminder to everyone, uh, for all of these episodes, I put chapter markers into the ID3 tag of the audio. So if you are using Apple Podcasts or as I do a, an app like Pocket Casts or any, you know, modern updated podcast player, 
you should be able to view all the chapters in each podcast episode and then skip around. Uh, so if you want to skip ahead to the lecture right now, you can. Uh, also, these chapter markers are included in the YouTube videos. So if you're watching this on YouTube or listening and you got something else going on in the background, you can go and either uh, on the timeline click uh, among the different chapters or in the episode description uh, that you'll be able to see a table of contents with time codes and you can click on those. So I've mentioned this several times, but if you uh, if you're interested in, in hearing us talk about Reformed Academy more generally, thank you. Uh, we love uh, talking about our work and would love to hear from you. But if you're not interested in, in this these details, um, then skip ahead to the lecture if you'd like. But just I want to remind everyone that we take the time to make those chapter markers, so use them. Um, and not a lot of podcasts do that because uh, it's it's annoying. <laughs> right. well, yeah, it's time consuming for you. You mean yeah? It's, but there's great it's a labor of love. There's though. there's great benefit down the road, and I, it also helps me in in the creation of the the video highlights and stuff mm -hmm. like that. So there are some synergies here, but. Let's talk about the process here of sure. of creating a course, because I think some people might be interested to hear a little behind the scenes how this works, and um, and then uh, perhaps we can parlay that into talking more the bigger picture about you know the roadmap and the vision that we have for Reformed Academy, which and then we'll that'll allow us to uh, let people know how they might be able to help us achieve that yeah. vision for the future. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, one thing that you mentioned that was that was important, Camden, is that we don't just come up with our ideas for reform form or reformed academy courses out of the blue, or or even necessarily based on what what's interesting to us at the moment. Right. But really, in terms of what local churches in the states and around the world are are telling us would be helpful for the gathering and the perfecting of the saints, and so that's why we focused on on the catechism and on covenant theology and and you know. Van Til's work as well. And right. So, this stuff doesn't exist right. and people want it. Right. How many and, times and have I heard it. from people, people in, in even a brother in Colombia who keeps telling me, we need Van Til in Spanish. Yeah. And how, what a joy it is to be able to say, brother, we have uh, two full courses yeah. with subtitles right. and Lord willing accompanying books yeah. you know, to come yes. in Spanish, even. Correct. Um, so that's a joy. So we're trying to serve the church very intentionally in, in the, uh, the work that we're doing in our Reformed Academy. How it happens is uh, in terms of um, we record the course, we bring them in here uh, to Reform Forum Studio or our mm -hmm. office, and um, after that, you take a, a ton of time to uh, to edit the uh, the videos and chop them up. Mm -hmm. I watch them first, and I give you all the time codes and say this right. is where you need to put a break here, and I yeah. I come up with the uh, just not as simple as you think. And, no, it's not. You need because to... the, the the lecture notes that we receive are not not always formatted in a way for producing video. <laughs> That's true. That's true. Yes. And Doctor. And sometimes is, the notes aren't don't exist. <laughs> it's sometimes they don't exist. Yeah. And with with someone whom the Lord has just tremendously gifted in this way, he could have a lecture that doesn't follow the notes at all. Yes. You know, but he just knows the material. Yeah. It just and comes it's, out. It's tremendous. Uh, right. So um, after we get all the videos chopped up. Then we go into uh, kind of the course building stage in our uh, Learn Dash software uh, mm -hmm. for our Reformed Academy. And we and should say this is this is integrated into our website. So we use right. WordPress as our content management system, and then we use a plugin called Learn Dash, which uh, extends the functionality of WordPress. So people are able to take a course inside WordPress. You can log in with a free account. You can create an account and then log in. And then see all of our courses, and then you can register, right? And what's it look like there when people register? Like what? Describe it. Well, yeah, when, when people register, you're you're immediately uh, given full and free access to, to all of our courses. There's no additional payments or anything yeah. involved. And you're brought to uh, our course page where you can see all of our offerings uh -huh. with, with uh, small descriptions. You're able to, to download our, our course materials. And you're able to begin that process of of guided instruction, step mm -hmm. by step. On your own way. time, right? On your own time, yeah. yeah Working your way through the course. Um, and then you're also able to, at at offerings as the Lord provides, um, to, to go deeper by joining a cohort that mm -hmm. will accompany um, one or more of the courses. 
We've yeah. already given uh, offered two cohorts in the past, Unvinced. and we're we're following mm-hmm. that. Um, uh, the, our fellowship in Reformed apologetics, right. which is all about Van Til's Trinity, Van Til's theology and his mm-hmm. apologetics. And uh, Lord right. willing, we'll have more of those to come. Yes, uh, but that's, ver- an, that's an eight or right. or more week course in which we'll meet uh, weekly. After having watched uh, the the video uh, for that that lesson, and mm-hmm. also done uh, in some cases a large amount of reading, reading from from primary and secondary sources, and then we gather with the instructor to have a uh, you know a, a, a structured discussion, not mm-hmm. a free for all, but one in which which students are really able to to interact face to face and to to get their questions answered or to float new ideas or to talk about potential avenues for original research or how they might apply this in their local churches really to bring the whole so what question uh to bear in a group of like-minded students that want to serve the lord and want to sit under faithful teaching yes yeah this has been a very effective way for us to extend the on-demand portion the the, the, what we're doing through reformed academy is is in many ways on-demand global education but there it's not you know obviously the there are there are better ways and more advanced ways to educate you can't Mm -hmm. always do it at scale but for those people who want to go deeper and have the ability and the time uh, we offer these cohorts and we're looking to offer, find more ways to educate and to connect people with other people who want to learn to other students and to encourage um, growth in this way, obviously within the context of local churches. We never want anyone to be, you know, some sort of rogue student who's who's doing something outside the context of their church or their church is disapproving of it or unaware mm-hmm. of it, whatever. This never our intention. We never want us uh, to um, replace Christian education in the home and in the local church and even in the regional church through or through denominations, but to supplement that with like-minded churches, either churches that are in Nay Park or the ICRC. Those are our mm. those are our ecumenical relations there. Okay, so we're looking to expand and to do more in terms of Christian education in this route as much as possible to make things free and accessible to all. Uh, But that requires that we would record these courses, try to get them translated, and then build them out. So let's let's get to the details. What does it look now after having just finished uh, building this course out? How can, uh, you know, how, how do we do this and what does it look like and, you know, who, what types of people are helping so mm-hmm. that people get an, a sense of all the labor that went into this free course that's available for them online? Right. Um, in, terms of, in terms of other laborers that we, that we partner with, um, we've, we've looked to for our initial uh, translations or our initial subtitles, uh, Rev.com. Yeah, we they, use a service. It's, that, a, it's a, right. a service where... Um, you have certified native speakers who are able to very quickly, uh, I'm talking one or two day turnaround. Oh, they did the entire course uh, in one day. Yeah. I, did, I put the order in for all 51 videos um, in the morning and by the evening they were complete. Right. In English, Spanish, and Chinese, formatted, integrated, mm-hmm. and available uh, through our, our Vimeo account. Right. It was amazing. Yeah. But that's not enough. So we use no, that. It's, we, not enough. it's an yeah. amazing service. We love it. it it's relatively affordable. Uh, it's super fast. What is most important is that we also have now the technological means to update them. And then it automatically syncs back to our Vimeo account, which is where our videos are hosted. So it's ex- extremely convenient and mm-hmm. integrated. But what do we do yeah. now that we have translations and subtitles that are provided by people who may or may not understand our subject matter. Right. That's where I'll go back in and look at the English mm-hmm. uh, subtitles just to make sure that everything is everything is good. Um, even the best ears, and, and we're talking native speakers here. These are not, you know, ESL students that are, right. are translating this. Um, sometimes you make a mistake. Let me, let me or, give you one. Or you might be from New Jersey. Right. And you can't talk correctly. Right, right. We, have one, we have one teacher like that. Yeah, <laughs> He's a Mets fan and, and folks know him. Yeah. But but in our case, because because Camden, and we'd, you'd want to do this in any calling, 
uh, seek to be found faithful in, in, in the Lord's eyes. Yes. But particularly when we're dealing with, with matters of, of life and death, and, yes. and, and, and we are coming alongside the church that has the keys of the kingdom, mm-hmm. we want to make sure that we're communicating what is faithful and radically consistent with Scripture. Mm-hmm. And so uh, sometimes there'll be you know, an innocent error of the ear where the, uh, uh, the, the person might say, Adam was created immutable, <laughs> right? Instead of, instead of mutable. Right. And says, well, we don't, no, that's, that's not right. And so we'll go back and, and make that correction. Sure. A lot of times um, uh, you'll have native speakers that, that catch every word, but they might be unfamiliar with our, our niche of Reformed theology. Yes. And so they've never heard of Herman Bavink or Van Til. Yeah. And they might spell that any one of five different ways, yeah. right? Or, or know, you know, that this is this is a proper noun here because it's the title of a book rather yeah. than just, yes. you know, a description. A description. So then we uh, we get all that fixed in English, and then we employ many different volunteers. I shouldn't say yeah. employ; they're they're volunteers. Uh, we have many people that come alongside us and help. And we've had many, many offers, so we're, we're trying to, to stick as much as possible with people with whom we're familiar, and specifically with people we're not only familiar with them, but also with their church context and whatnot. But there, mm. there are many times in which things might be grammatically correct. They might be syntactically correct, but they're not correct for the ecclesiastical context. Right. One example we brought up before, but this comes up a lot, is what word do we use for covenant in different languages? And you might have something that's absolutely correct. And one example is there's a great difference in in Latin America on the word that you use. In the Reformed churches that I've been in, and when I visited Colombia, they use pacto all the time. I don't know offhand what the the translation is for the, or what the other alternative is. I'm slipping my mind because we use pacto. But the other version might be um, much more common with, I might be getting this all mixed up, but there, there is a word that is used that's syntactically and grammatically correct, but it is more identified with Roman Catholic theology. Mm. Now, you need to have wisdom in terms of where and when to try to overcome false understandings of concepts merely through the use of a word and when it makes sense to just use a different word that doesn't have the baggage. Right. That's the nature of theological interpretation. Mm-hmm. I mean, Bible translators have been dealing with this for centuries. Yeah. So these are some of the challenges that we need to address and that we seek to work through. But we're always seeking to do it with native speakers who are familiar with the theology, but more importantly, also connected with um, you know, indigenous churches uh, with whom we... Uh, you know, NAPARC and ICRC churches, but specifically our board members uh, have interaction. Mm -hmm. This is where the work of Douglas Clawson comes in so significantly. He's a board member, but he's also uh, the Associate General Secretary for Foreign Missions for the OPC. So he has a lot of hands-on and boots-on-the-ground experience with people in fields. And if he doesn't, he knows somebody that does. Mm -hmm. And so... We as a parachurch are seeking to support the church, but also to come alongside the church and perhaps other parachurch organizations who have expertise in certain domains. Um, We're not foreign missionaries. We engage in the assistance of and, and in a lot of activities that help in foreign missions and in Christian education in foreign fields. But Reform Forum is not trying to cultivate and maintain a specific you know, missionary relationships and ecumenical relationships in the field. Right. That's, that's the work of the church, properly speaking, mm-hmm. not orga- or, or, uh, you know, or, organism. This church's is, institute. Yeah, institute organ- organism. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, we have people involved at Reform Forum who do these th- sorts of things in terms of their calling as ministers, specifically working in and through the church. So it's not an either or, mm-hmm. you know, there's some overlap there. Right. But that's how we conceptualize those things. And it's been going well. We, you you, yeah, you have a well. lot of contact with people through email and, and through the phone and are hearing 
wonderful things uh, from people. I just, when yeah. I was down in Columbia, I, somebody came up to me and says, uh, you work with Ryan, right? And I go, oh, yes. Wow. Praise the Lord. <laughs> and, yeah. I do. And uh, so uh, you, you beat me. Uh, you had already digitally met and right. had been interacting. I was interacting. the forerunner. And then you went <laughs> there. And, yeah. No, you know, we've we've had occasion a number of times, Camden, just to uh, just to just to give God praise and to be drawn to doxology for Reformed Academy, and, and because it's a case in point that He is bringing people to us that yeah. we haven't necessarily sought out, no, and we do not know. And so I receive emails from folks, and I love, I try to do my best to respond in a timely manner yeah. about how this is this has encouraged them in their knowledge of Christ or helped them understand the covenants better. Or has has taken them from from this one error into a more biblical understanding, mm. and people from all different countries, and so that's that's the work of the Holy Spirit, mm-hmm. who is is gathering and, and perfecting His people. And insofar as we do anything good at all, it is the work of God's grace, causing us to toil with all our energy mm-hmm. for the sake of Jesus' glory. Um, so it's it's been a real joy just to uh, just to see how big the body of Christ is and how how much bigger God's vision is for bringing oh. the, the riches of the Reformed faith to the whole world than, than ours is. I know. It just, oh, it, that was one of the greatest um, benefits to me personally, the, the, how the Lord blessed me in my trip to Columbia, just to, to see with my eyes and hear with my ears uh, the testimony to his grace in the lives of these people. And um, we're, sometimes we can think, Okay, number one, we're hovering around 3,000 students at Reformed Academy. Praise the Lord. We don't care about numbers, but we're thankful that people are coming. Yeah. You know, we're just seeking to be faithful. The Lord's given us this opportunity and and um, these resources in terms of our time and opportunity and our knowledge and whatnot to share that with people who would like to to learn. And praise the Lord that he's, you know, seems to be bringing about a certain type of harvest. It's not the final harvest. It's not what I'm saying, but a certain type of harvest in terms of the, um, the increasing knowledge and awareness and the deepening understanding that people have of their Lord and savior. But when we're, when we here are working in Illinois and, um, working on a computer a lot, uh, you know, you don't always connect the numbers and the, you know, the, the, the completed lessons that people are doing online you don't connect it conceptually and, and in your heart with mm-hmm. actual people's lives. Right. They're, they're there. There are real people at the other end of these digital transactions in the sense of, you know, clicking and receiving and that kind of thing. But to go, uh, well, one, to discuss and talk with people through email is one thing. To talk with them on a phone is another. To go there in person and hear how the materials we've been putting online have been helpful to people. It mm-hmm. just changes your, your, at least for me, it enlarged my, my vision and my scope of mm-hmm. my awareness of what the Lord was doing. And it's very humbling mm-hmm. because it also shrinks us as we ought to be shrunk right. and helps us to uh, see the greatness and the glory of the Lord and what he's doing mm-hmm. and how we are privileged. Every single person in Christ is privileged in one way, shape or form to be a part of this body and to perform the the function that the Lord has called us to perform as a member of that body, mm. and He gives us the grace, a unique measured, a unique measure of His varied grace to accomplish the work that He set before us. You know, First Peter, but we could also think of uh, Ephesians two, and all, all of these passages which talk about our role in the body that way. Mm. So, man, it's just you know, from my perspective, we just want to do more work. He was right, seeing right. what the Lord has been doing. We would love to record more and more courses. We have a whole roadmap of 89 courses. We could add more, but mm-hmm. we have people geared up and capable of teaching these courses. It's not like we're looking around now, oh, well, we need a course on X, Y, and Z, and who in the world could we ever have? Or We don't need to send people off to get educated to teach these things. Right. It's like we're locked and loaded. I mean, we've got a magazine that is full. Yeah, full clip. Yeah. Full clip. It's ready to go. And uh, what do we do? We need um, to schedule them. We need to bring them into the studio. We need to record them. We need to get, edit those recordings. We need to do so uh, with the view of the church in mind that we're recording the courses that the church needs and not just things that are mm-hmm. peculiar interest to us, but that are that are um, demanded by the church that no one else is doing such things. 
and then we need to get them translated. Right. Now, in terms of resources, we have all the right now, at least by God's grace, we have all the all the um, the teachers that we need at the moment. Uh, we're not lacking in that. We have all the equipment that we need. The Lord has been gracious uh, to provide us funds, and we've used that to to purchase a lot of audio video equipment. None of it's ostentatious, but it's all very good, mm-hmm. and we're able to do high quality stuff. You know, at least within my limits of my abilities as a cinematographer, but it's getting better. It's, you oh, know, yeah, it's absolutely. getting better. It's top notch, brother. Well, it, it, there, there's room to room to improve. There's always room to grow. We're not. <laughs> we believe in the fourfold state of man, and there's yeah. always room to grow. You know? I'm maybe a little hard. I'm harder on myself than than others. But you, when you're intimately involved in, oh, in sure. something, you know, you see all the flaws and whatnot. Yeah. Um, where do we go from there? We need more time. We can't buy time. Um, but um expanding people's roles and having more people help out assists in in uh in the time aspect because then you know if we have other people to do different types of work then i can focus on the next thing or developing my own courses for example Mm -hmm. can free you up to do other type of work um this this is something we need assistance in and and uh translation Yes. You know, we need we need help in terms largely just in terms of finances in order to fund these projects. Right now, we're not lacking for people to do the work or to help at the moment. But the more courses we teach, that that bill starts to increase. I mean, we're talking three dollars a minute for Spanish, at least five dollars a minute for Chinese. We would like to add other languages. It would be useful for a global theological education. Um, Portuguese, French, maybe Hindu, Arabic, you know, we were trying to focus on those areas where we have established church relationships in the mission field. Right. So that's why we focused on Spanish and Chinese. And we do, we do have but Arabic is avail- available as well. We do for my for your covenant theology course. course, which is great. Yeah. But we don't have, um, uh, many established fields in, in the, in the Middle Eastern world, the Arabic right. speaking community. So it's a little bit more of a challenge for us to get those specific translations and whatnot. Yeah. But that's true. We're going where the Lord is, is, uh, indicated that, um, that there's need and interest. Mm. And even, and even, there's no lack of interest among the, the people in Latin America. Oh, right. And, and in China, and too. And China. In, yes. I mean, it's just like, you can't up. do enough. It's like, yeah. you know, we'll, we'll produce a course. We're like, oh, finally, here, here's this new course. And then like the next day, what else you got? Right. I finished it. Right. <laughs> but yeah, if, if, if our listeners have a particular burden for something or see even in their local church, I'm thinking about um, how, we, how we arrived at the Arabic subtitles for yes. your course. Yeah, that was that was due to a specific a home, a home mission concern. Yeah, of an individual. Yeah, who, who said I I have I have this this uh, blessing from the Lord financially. Right. I want to I want to invest here for this specific purpose, and yes. it happened. We made Praise it happen. Praise the Lord. Yeah. So insofar as Quickly. as you are you know moved by the Spirit and your heart is stirred, mm-hmm. let us know how we can we can help uh, serve the church in in your area. Right. So uh, before getting to the last lecture of the Union with Christ course here tacked on, uh, here's the ask. And I've got two, um, you know, other than the other things in terms of, you know, sign up, get an account, take a course in Reformed Academy. If you've never been in there, log in. It's free. There'll be links. You can watch the videos, enjoy it. We hope you learn something. We know you will if you take the time to to uh, invest, uh, you know, in yourself, so to speak, in your theological education. But um, I'm going to ask two specific things. Number one, please tell us the courses that you want to 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 learn to, to see exist. If you are desirous of learning something and you believe that our specific gifts and abilities at Reform Forum will help accomplish that, let us know, and we'll prioritize courses that are in demand that the church is asking for. Uh, whether those courses be on Aspects of systematic theology, apologetics, evangelism, church history, New Testament, Old Testament, biblical theology, you name it. You let us know. We have a roadmap of 89 courses that we're geared up and ready to begin working through. But um, we would love to hear if there are additional courses that need to be added to that list. But more importantly, what Mm -hmm. order to put them in and uh, trying to capitalize on what is of most importance right now. 
So we, you and I talk about prioritizing and all this sorts of all these sorts of things, and we're definitely in the position where we're not making decisions among good things and bad things to do. We're not even making decisions about uh, good things and other good things to do. You know, we have to make the decision because you only have so much time and opportunity between the best thing, the excellent mm-hmm. things, and other things that are really good things, but right. they're not the excellent thing. Yeah. And uh, you are, know, are, are we at challenge. liberty to yeah. to say what what is coming next in December? Sure. What what course we hope to uh, to produce? Well, we don't. Yeah, that I don't. Or maybe know. just a topic. That, that's yeah. fine. I, I'm just so excited about it, and and you know, listeners have have demanded it. Yeah. Um, so we we do have another course that Lord willing will be recording in in December uh, that that will be unlike in terms of in terms of the topic, any of the courses we've uh, done hitherto for. Yes, we certainly, we, we want to flesh out a, a vast array of courses that have massive impact on people's daily lives as well. So in light of that, you know, you mentioned evangelism, apologetics, that certainly has a lot of practical aspect, but issues of, of, of worship and personal piety, things mm-hmm. like that, um, you know, we're, we're certainly interested and open to cultivating so if you if you have some desire or has particular interest or requests, please submit those. An easy way to do that is by sending an email to mail at reformedforum.org. Ryan checks that uh, faithfully, and he will get back to you. But the other ask, in addition to that, is support us financially. Uh, in addition to prayer, we need that. Pray for the people, the students, that this would be effective and useful and that the Lord would would uh, would bless the efforts here. But we also ask that you would partake uh, in our mission and vision by partnering with us. And uh, you can visit us at reformedforum.org slash donate. And uh, you can you can donate there online. We're working very hard to get a better system up very soon, before the end of the year at least. I have a phone call coming up uh, to get this migration, but we're working to move to a new system which will allow people to donate more easily through the web, but also to have a a donor portal where you may sign up for a monthly gift and manage your gift. Right now you can do monthly gifts, but you have to, if you need it altered, you need to discontinue it, or you want to change the frequency or the amount or the payment method, you have to contact us through email. And it's, we we hate that. It's lamentable. It's lamentable. We love talking to people, but we want to make this as easy and convenient for you as possible. So we're working to get there. So pray for us in that regard. But if you'd just love to talk to us, you'd love to talk to me on the phone, talk to Ryan on the phone, and, and and work out, you know, to hear more about what we have planned and the details that we have in store for Reformed Academy, we would love to talk to you. But um, we want to think with a big vision. We don't want to place limits on what the Lord might do or what you, our, our listeners and viewers, might do as part of our extended community. Uh, but it's not as if we're grasping around trying to figure out you know a plan for the future we we realize that the lord is blessing these efforts significantly that there are many people around the world who want more of these resources the problem for us is not trying to figure out what to do it's just doing the work that's already on the table i don't want to sound i guess too uh it's not mechanistic or just too, but that that's that's what's before us. If people ask me, how can we pray for you? Or what are the challenges before you were reformed forum? It's just being able to do the work that we know is a good idea to do. Right. We just don't have the throughput. We don't. We have the knowledge, the ability, the desire, the interest. We have the proof of the market or the audience that they want what we have. It's just we cannot do it fast enough. That's in the Lord's hands, right? You know, we're, we're finite people and can only do so much. We'd love to do more, but the way to do more is either you know, just you know, the Lord, the Lord needs to provide more people, right. more finances, whatever. So if that is on your heart, if you're listening to this and you say, "Wow, this sounds really neat," what they're doing, or I'd like to be part of that, or even if you just want to hear more, you call us up or send us an email. We'll schedule a time. You want to come by? We'll show you around. There's not much to see, but we'll show you around. <laughs> <laughs> a lot of books. And- yeah, and pray for us. And and if you have an idea, if, some, mm-hmm. if you're listening to this and say, man, I wonder if these guys have thought about this or, oh, there's this, this, this glaring gap in what they're thinking about. Mm-hmm. Call us up and let us know. We, we'll, we'd love to hear it. And uh, 
Our mission here at Reformed Forum is to assist the church in her call to present every person mature in Christ. So if you're curious and interested in that, um, then we are too. So we'd love to partner with you on that front. So now, without uh, any more talking, we'll take you over to the last lecture. We've done the Alpha. Now we're going to do the Omega on this course. And uh, this is Lane Tipton teaching the final complete lecture from the new course, Union with Christ, The Benefits of His Suffering and Glory. We come now to union with Christ and sanctification. And if we're thinking in terms of union and the distinct and inseparable benefits of that union, justification, adoption, we come now to sanctification, which is a work of God. And the Shorter Catechism, 35, and then its amplification in Westminster Larger Catechism number 75, together with a treatment of Romans 6, 1 through 12, will guide us in our understanding of the nature of sanctification as dying to sin and rising to God in new life. Shorter Catechism 35, sanctification is the work of God's free grace whereby we are renewed in the whole man in the image of God and enabled more and more to die to sin and live to righteousness. Sanctification, unlike justification and adoption, which are acts of God, sanctification is a work of God, something that in the language of the Shorter Catechism renews, enables a once for all and ongoing death to sin and a once for all and ongoing living unto God in righteousness. But the larger catechism amplifies this quite significantly and quite helpfully and brings to bear the application of the death of Jesus and the resurrection of Jesus to the believer in union with Christ. Sanctification, according to 75, is a work of God's grace, whereby they whom God hath before the foundation of the world chosen to be holy, chosen to be renewed, are in time, through the powerful operation of His Spirit, applying the death symbolized by the cross, and the resurrection, symbolized by that upward arrow, through the powerful operation of the Spirit, applying the death and the resurrection of Christ unto them, are renewed in their whole man after the image of God. Having the seeds of repentance unto life and all other saving graces put in their hearts, and those graces so stirred up, increased, and strengthened, as they more and more die unto sin and rise unto newness of life. It's especially in the larger catechism that the death and resurrection of Christ, the efficacy of his two estates, are applied to the believer. So sanctification is a work of the Holy Spirit in union with Christ, and the Spirit sanctifies especially and concretely as he applies the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ to believers in union with Christ. Now, what we need to say here will take a bit more time to develop than our discussion of justification and adoption. But here's what we need to begin to understand. What is sequential in the life experience of Jesus Christ? The movement from the estate of humiliation, death on a cross, to his resurrection and ascension on the third day and then 40 days after the third day he ascends. What is sequential in the life experience of Jesus is applied distinctly, inseparably, and simultaneously to the believer by the Holy Spirit. So, the two estates of Christ, his death and resurrection, which are sequential in time, are applied at the same time to the believer 
in sanctification. And so if we can look at this benefit here, I don't want to confuse this too much, but this benefit of redemption, the efficacy of Jesus' death and resurrection are applied at the same time to the believer in sanctification. The larger catechism helps us begin to see that in sanctification, the Holy Spirit, through the gospel, works a death to sin and a life to God in the believer in union with Christ. We cannot think of sanctification, in other words, apart from a participation in the Spirit by faith in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. The believer dies to sin and lives to God in union with Jesus Christ. This is worked mysteriously and supernaturally by the power of the Spirit so that His supernatural and sovereign power works death and sin and life to God at the same time in the one united to Christ. Now, rather than presenting this material in terms of discrete proof texts in the Bible, I want to spend some time reflecting on a central text that makes this clear, Romans 6, 1 through 12. And so, in justification, it was Romans 5. In adoption, it was Romans 8. For sanctification, it will be Romans 6. Uh, with a special emphasis on verses 5 and 10 through 11. I have to be selective. We can't work through the whole text equally. Romans 6, 1 through 12, supplies, in my estimate, the classic text that speaks of sanctification in terms of a participation in the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ through the Spirit's agency, working through the Word. We'll have to be selective as we look at this, but here's the first line of development. Pardon me, it's Romans 6, 6 here, not Romans 6, 5. Romans 6, 6. Here's the first thesis. Romans 5, 12 through 21, which we've looked at, supplies the immediate context for Romans 6, 6, and the crucifixion of our old man in Christ. The crucifixion of our old man in Christ. That text reads, Romans 6, 6, Our old man was crucified together with him, so that the power of sin might be brought to nothing, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin. Now, as you remember, Romans 5, 12 through 21, talks about Adam in his federal and representative headship. And there are three things to remember that frame the meaning of Romans 6, 6, with its background being Romans 5, 12 through 21. First, Paul presents an immediate conjunction between the sin of Adam and the death of all. Romans 5.15, by the trespass of one, the many died. 5.15 is a key text. Paul's argument is that Adam's trespass implicates all he represents in death. Second, there's an immediate conjunction between the sin of Adam and the condemnation of all, which we saw earlier. Romans 5.16, the judgment was from one unto condemnation. Third, notice the immediate conjunction between Adam's sin and the sin of all. In Adam's fall, all sinned in him and fell with him. Romans 5.12. Now the point in context 
is that Paul conceives of humanity in Adam, as we saw in our doctrine of justification, in federal and representative categories. What Adam affected in his sin, death, and condemnation included all he represented, so that there's an immediate conjunction between his sin and the sin of all, his death and the death of all, his condemnation and the condemnation of all. And that provides precisely the frame of reference for Romans 6.6. 6. Paul's statement in Romans 6.6 6 is about the crucifixion of Christ in relation to his elect united to the first Adam in his sin, death, and condemnation. He says, knowing this, and I'll amplify this just a bit, knowing this, that our old man in Adam was crucified with Christ so that the body of sin might be destroyed and that we might no longer be slaves to sin. First, Paul's reference here to our old man is a reference to all of God's people who sinned in and fell with Adam in his first transgression. It's a corporate phrase designed to include all of God's elect who sinned in and fell with Adam. Herman Ritterboss, in his wonderful book entitled Paul, an Outline of His Theology, says this, We have to understand the old man, not in the first place in the sense of the believer's life experience or the ordo salutis, but in the history of of redemption. That is to say, it is a matter here not of a change that comes about in the way of faith and conversion in the life of the individual Christian, but of that which took place in Christ once and in which his people had part in him in the corporate sense. This is at least the obvious meaning of Romans 6.6. 6. Our old man was crucified with Christ, that is, on Golgotha, the old man, the old mode of existence of sin, was then judged and cursed. Thus, to speak of the old man being crucified together with Christ is parallel to speaking of our old man sinning and falling with Adam and in Adam. In Adam, we sinned and fell. In Christ, that old man in Adam was crucified together with Christ. Just as our old man was constituted in sin, death, and condemnation, so our old man in Christ has been crucified. The bond between Christ and his church, Christ and his covenant people, is historical and representative, just as is the relation between Adam and those he represents. The death of Christ is a covenantal event that has direct significance for his church, his people, those for whom he died. And so Paul's description of the old man is that our old man corporately has been crucified with Christ. Not only was Christ crucified for his elect, but the elect are crucified with Christ. This is what makes definite atonement effective. The old man in Adam, fallen and condemned, is crucified together with Christ. And there are two results of this. The first, the body of sin might be brought to nothing. The body of sin, if understood properly, pertains to everything associated with the old order in Adam. It is an objective order, a state of affairs dominated by sin, in which we once participated in our union with Adam. But that old man, that body of sin, has been put away. It has been rendered null and void so that, secondly, sin would no longer have dominion over us. Our old man is crucified with Christ so that our sanctification, our death to sin, 
is not rooted first and foremost in any experience in our lives. It is rooted in the objective accomplishment of redemption in the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. So that we would no longer be slaves of sin. To put it in dogmatic categories, the death of Christ destroys the total depravity and total inability that makes sinners dead in sin. It does so objectively as a function of His suffering. Just as we became slaves of sin due to our covenantal solidarity with Adam, so we have been freed from the dominion of sin by Christ putting our old man to death in His death and resurrection. Now, given that that's the case, our first point here is that Romans 6.6 6 brings into view what was once for all accomplished by Christ in His estate of humiliation. This is amplifying what we talked about earlier regarding the accomplishment of redemption. And given the doctrine of sanctification and given the teaching of Romans 6, we have to review that and, and situate sanctification in this way. Now, here's the question. How does what happened once and for all in Christ's crucifixion come to benefit us, the church, in union with Him by the Spirit and through faith? Well, the second text that's going to be controlling for us is Romans 6, 10 through 11. As I said earlier, Romans 6, 6 and Romans 6, 10 through 11 will be controlling for our understanding here. It is, in fact, I think, the most biblical, direct biblical proof text for the language of Larger Catechism 75. The death he died, he died to sin once and for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Now, Romans 6.10, we're going to start with. Romans 6.10 is a single sentence summary of the two estates of Jesus Christ. His earthly estate of suffering and death and His heavenly estate of glory and life. 6.10a, the first half of 6.10, defines that earthly estate as a death that He died to sin. Christ's entire earthly ministry was a life of returning to God by being dead to sin. The death He died is a comprehensive description of His earthly ministry using its climax on the cross as a point of reference. So while His death on the cross is the climax of His death to sin, that death is organically related to His obedience throughout His earthly ministry. Jesus knew no sin, 2 Corinthians 5.21. Satan had no claim on Him, John 14.30. The entire earthly ministry of Christ was a dying to sin in the sense that He never lived to it, never participated in it, never in thought or word or deed committed sin. He knew no sin, and His entire life was a comprehensive dying to it. But Paul is specific in 6.10 that the death He died was a death to sin. And that brings into view his death on the cross. Paul doesn't speak in a progressive sense in 10a. He speaks in a once for all sense. And he clearly brings into view once and for all Jesus' death on the cross. He says that death was with reference to sin. Sin as a comprehensive reality that dominates this eon. His death on the cross was his translation out of the visible earthly realm of sin. And so the death that he died 
on the cross, 10b, was a death to sin in this present visible eon. He was sinless in his person. He was representative in his work. And the death he died to sin was the death of a sinless, sin-bearing substitute. He remained under its power for three days, and it was a once-for-all death to sin, to a sinful eon. It is a death that will never be repeated again. Now, Romans 6.10b, the death he died, he died to sin, but the life he lives, he lives to God. This is his second estate, his estate of exaltation. Romans 6.10b says that the life of Jesus as raised and ascended is that he lives to God. Jesus Christ, having perfectly returned to God in death, has now been raised and returned to God in imperishable, life-giving power. He has been raised, Romans 6, 4, to walk in newness of life. As raised and especially as ascended, he has reached the fullness of life that was held out to Adam under the covenant of works. He lives in heaven to intercede for his church as a minister and servant of the new covenant. He sits on the throne of the majesty in heaven and he lives to God. As we said in our adoption segment, Acts 2, 28, he has come to know the paths of life and has been filled with the pleasure of God at his right hand. He died to sin throughout his earthly ministry, climaxing in death on a cross. And this life to God is now his translation into heaven. Hebrews 9, 24 and 8, 1 through 2 and Acts 2, 32 through 33 to remind of what we covered earlier. The point of analogy then in verse 11 is a point of analogy for believers in union with Christ in verse 11. Verse 6, Jesus. Verse 11, believers in union with Jesus. In a similar way, consider yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Here's where that point I made earlier needs to be pushed. Believers in union with Christ are being returned to God as dead to sin, but alive to God in union with Christ. For Christ, the dying to sin and living to God was an historical movement, a change of a state, a before and after in his life experience. He died to sin, remained under the power of death for three days, and then was raised to new life three days later. And 40 days after that, ascended up into heaven where he sits at the right hand of God in the power of an indestructible life. And now the point, is that both of these, both the efficacy of Jesus' death and the efficacy of Jesus' resurrection are applied to those united to him distinctly, inseparably, and simultaneously. Simultaneously. Distinctly, inseparably, and simultaneously, believers have died to sin and are alive to God in union with Jesus Christ. In union with Christ in his death, the Spirit works conformity to Jesus' earthly suffering and disenfranchises the believer from this fallen earthly order. The power of Christ's death at work in you 
is that you are conformed to his obedient suffering and disenfranchised from this present earthly order of sin and death. The death that Jesus died to sin is that which the Spirit applies to the believer. But in union with Christ in his resurrection, the Spirit works conformity to Jesus' joyful comfort in heaven and enfranchises into heaven where Christ is, an order marked by righteousness and life, not sin and death. The life that Jesus lives to God in heaven is applied by the Spirit to believers. Instead of walking in sins and trespasses, they walk in newness of life. And they know the comfort and the glory of Christ. But how does the death and resurrection of Jesus, His suffering and His glory, bear on those being sanctified? Well, Let's speak first of union with Christ in his death. Remembering that it's inseparable from union with Christ in his life, but let's talk specifically and concretely what union with Christ in his death involves. We can say this to begin. It is by his cross that you are delivered from this present evil age and conform to Jesus' righteousness and suffering. First, deliverance from this age. Galatians 1.4 says this, that Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. So when we're talking about the application of Jesus' cross, Romans 6.10, Galatians 1.4 says that by this cross we are being delivered out of this age and into the age to come. Galatians 1.4. The death that Jesus died to sin involved his being delivered out of this present evil age. And Paul says that Jesus gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age. The cross of Jesus Christ, as presented in Luke 9.31 when he's speaking to Moses and Elijah, the cross of Jesus Christ begins an exodus out of Jerusalem. When Jesus spoke on the Mount of Transfiguration to Moses and Elijah of the exodus out of Jerusalem, he was thinking first of his cross and then of his glory. And the movement of that exodus out of Jerusalem was that he would go the way of the cross and be delivered over to death and remain under its power for a time. And as he was on the cross, he spoke to the thief and said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. The exodus is out of this age and into the age to come, out of the fallen earthly realm and into the heavenly realm of paradise. The cross is not only a wrath propitiating cross, Romans 5, 9. It's not only a sin expiating cross, Hebrews 9, 26. It's not only a church reconciling cross, Colossians 1, 21, and a redemption securing cross, Galatians 3, 23. But the cross disenfranchises you from this present evil age in an exodus-like deliverance out of this evil age. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb delivered out of Egypt, so that the blood of Jesus delivers out of this present evil age. As you are being delivered out of this age, you are strangers and exiles. 1 Peter 2 11 and 12. When you, by spirit-gifted faith, embrace Jesus, you are disenfranchised as you are being delivered from this present evil age. But secondly, closely related to this, as the Spirit applies the efficacy of the cross to you, 
disenfranchises you from this age and begins delivering you out of this present evil age, the Spirit, through the cross, through the efficacy of Jesus' death, at the same time conforms you to His righteousness and suffering. Paul can say in Philippians 3.10, and this builds on our 1 Corinthians 1.9 text, Paul can say that he wants to know the fellowship of his suffering as he is being conformed to his death in union with Christ. Christ not only saves you by his cross, forgives your sin, satisfies wrath, but that cross leaves its impress on you through the supernatural agency of the Spirit that conforms you to the Christ of the cross. And it produces, the Spirit, he produces a bond and fellowship marked by suffering for righteousness' sake and being conformed to the death of Jesus in his obedience to God. You are being returned to God in obedience and suffering as the Spirit applies to you the efficacy of the death of Jesus, a death that not only occasions a dying to sin, but a deliverance out of this world in a fellowship of suffering with Christ. Supernatural, Spirit-forged union produces this in the church. So the cross of Christ, as the Spirit applies to you the efficacy of union with Christ, the cross of Christ initiates for you a fellowship of suffering, a deliverance from this present evil age that Romans 6.11 can say is a death to sin, a dying to sin. But not only does the Spirit apply to you the church, the efficacy of Jesus' death, Romans 6, 11a, but the efficacy of his resurrection life, his life to God, 6, 11b. So not only is the death of Jesus applied, 6, 11a, but the resurrection life, that is also applied to you in your union with Jesus Christ. Let me give you a text that brings into view what that means. 1 Peter 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to his great mercy, he has given us, uh, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead into an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed at the last time. Please see this first. The connection between the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and causing the church to be born again to a living hope. Peter reasons from the resurrection of the dead to the initial expression of new life, a living hope in union with Jesus Christ. Jesus' resurrection from the dead is a first fruits of one great resurrection harvest, not only at the end of the age, but at the beginning of the age. His resurrection carries with it the enlivening that is given in new birth, the principle of new life in union with him. The new birth is an organic function, an inevitable redemptive fruition of Jesus' resurrection as first fruits. To tie this to Romans 6:11, Jesus' resurrection life to God is the life that finds expression when believers are caused to be made alive in Him and with Him. We have been born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead as the Spirit applies to us the efficacy of His life as raised, 
never to die again. The actual resurrection life of Christ by the Spirit is at work in the church. And second, annexed to that, organically associated to that, new birth, is entrance into a kingdom that cannot perish, spoil, or fade, reserved in heaven for you. So when you're talking about 1 Peter 3, uh, 1, 3 through 5, it is a movement not only of being delivered out of this present evil age, but being delivered into heaven itself, into the kingdom of heaven. Death delivers you out of, resurrection delivers you into the world to come. Death out of this world, resurrection into the world to come. When you are joined to Christ, you are born again. The principle of new life is implanted. And as Jesus teaches in the new birth, you see and enter the kingdom of God. Peter amplifies Jesus' teaching that the new birth is quite literally into the kingdom of heaven. Heaven, according to Paul, is the invisible heaven, Colossians 1.16. It's the things above where Christ is seated, Colossians 3.2 and 1.16. Heaven is the dwelling made without hands, Hebrews 9.12. The heavenly reality after which the tabernacle was, a pat, was patterned, Hebrews 8.5. Heaven is the invisible temple dwelling of God created in the absolute beginning, Genesis 1.1, and populated with angels, Nehemiah 9.6. It is the location of Mount Zion, the city of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, Hebrews 12, 22. Heaven is what Meredith Klein refers to as the upper register, the realm of the spirit, metopolis, the city above. Therefore, as Christ was translated into heaven after his resurrection, so in Romans 6, 11b, as you are dead to sin, you are now alive to God, having entered into heaven by faith in Christ. Let me put it this way. As God enlivens, so he translates. As he renews, so he transitions. And the movement is from earth to heaven. It is a translational act. Paul even reasons, listen, in Colossians 3, 1 and 2, directly from being raised together with Christ by faith. Colossians 2, 12, Colossians 3, 1 through 2. He reasons directly from being raised with Christ through faith to seeking those things above where Christ is. If you are raised with Christ, Paul says, seek those things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Heaven is where Christ is, where Christ is seated. Those things above are set in direct and antithetical contrast. The ta'ano is set directly in contrast to epites geis, the things on earth. And the believer has died to the things on earth. Three, three. When Christ is revealed in glory, the glory of heaven, you will be revealed with him. Colossians 3, 4. You have died to the earthly things. You are alive to heavenly things. Resurrection life initiated in the new birth and brought to expression in sanctification translates you into the kingdom of heaven so that you seek that place where Christ is. You are instantly, when united to Christ, please hear this, instantly disenfranchised from this present evil age, constituted a pilgrim and a stranger in the language of Hebrews 13, 13 and 14. As long as you are on earth, you are exiles and strangers in this world as you seek the city and kingdom 
to come. Hebrews 13, 14, Colossians 3, 2. So to summarize this, the death of Christ delivers you from this present evil age, conforms you to his suffering and death, and at the same time, the resurrection of Christ translates you into the age to come and confers upon you an imperishable kingdom and enables a new walk in resurrection life. Both of these things, the efficacy of Jesus' death and the efficacy of Jesus' resurrection, are de- applied distinctly, inseparably, and simultaneously in union with Christ. Now, let me try to clarify this a bit more. This reality in Romans 6, 11, being dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus, is what we want to call this being dead to sin and alive to God, an irreversible condition, right? It's a work, not an act. So it's a condition, not of being dead, but being alive, not being a slave to sin, but being a slave to righteousness, not being, not walking in sins and trespasses, but walking in new life, walking in good works, Colossians 2.10. It is an irreversible condition, dead to sin, alive to God at the same time in union with Christ. Just as Christ died to sin and is alive to God, And that is true in such a way that the death he died, he died once and for all. So also you in Christ Jesus have died to sin and are alive to God. It is an irreversible condition. John Murray calls it definitive sanctification. In an essay in his collected writings, he puts it this way. It is just because we cannot allow for any reversal or repetition of Christ's death on the tree that we cannot allow for any compromise on the doctrine that every believer has died to sin and no longer lives under its dominion. Hence, the decisive and definitive entrance upon newness of life in the case of every believer is required by the fact that the resurrection of Christ was decisive and definitive. I like to put it for the believer, trying to clarify or expand on Murray's language, it is an irreversible condition wrought in the believer by virtue of union with Christ by faith. By decisive and definitive, Murray wants us to grasp in light of Romans 6, 1 through 12, that there is a once for all and irreversible condition entered into at the time point of union with Christ. Sanctification inaugurates a once for all and an irreversible condition. Now, what does that mean for your Christian life? Well, this dynamic arises. Resurrection life manifests itself in fellowship with God that is characterized both by a once-for-all decisive death to sin and life to God and a present ongoing dying to sin and living to God. There is a death and a life once for all. There is a dying and a living that is ongoing. Both of these mark this irreversible condition. A once for all death to sin and life to God and an ongoing dying to sin and living to God. In sanctification, then, there is both an irreversible condition brought about and an ongoing growth initiated. They go together. 
Sanctification in terms of its inception is a definitive once for all translation from the estate of sin and misery into the estate of grace as you die to sin and live to God. But sanctification in terms of its continuation is an ongoing and increasing dying to sin and living to God as the believer continues in the estate of grace. Putting it this way helps you understand that he who began a good work in you, irreversible condition, promises to carry it through to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. Progressive growth, Philippians 1.6. There is both a once-for-all death and life inaugurated, the definitive aspect of sanctification. There is also an ongoing dying to sin and living to God, what we could call progressive sanctification. And so there is definitive dimension and a progressive dimension to your sanctification, to this irreversible condition of new life as you are dying to sin. Paul makes this explicit in Romans 6, 12, and 18, the progressive character. Listen to what he says. He says that, or, or to, to frame it, that irreversible condition by no means undermines the commandment to resist sin, but presupposes it. Romans 6, 12. In light of all that's been said in Romans 6, 10, and 11, what does Paul say? Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal bodies, to make you obey their passions. The irreversible condition of 6.11 carries with it an ongoing obligation, an ongoing pursuit, not to let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Paul could be paraphrased as saying, since you are dead to sin in Christ, irreversible condition, continue to be dead to sin and do not let sin reign in your body. Ongoing pursuit. The definitive, and the progressive sweetly comply. But the priority rests on the irreversible condition of being dead to sin and alive to God since any ongoing progress presupposes such to be the case. To be joined to Christ in the likeness of His death and resurrection entails the compliance with the commandment of God not to let sin reign. Romans 6.18 makes this clear. We've been freed from sin and made servants of God in Christ. Both Richard Gaffin and Herman Ritterboss speak of what we have described in terms borrowed from grammar. The indicative is the irreversible condition of being dead to sin, alive to God in union with Christ. The imperative is the ongoing pursuit of death to sin and life to God in faith and obedience to God's commandments. John Murray's famous language of definitive and progressive sanctification is making the same point. Both of these ways of speaking are helpful. And let me simply help you recognize this, that there is an interweaving in the scriptures of the indicative and the imperative of the definitive and irreversible condition and the ongoing pursuit. Galatians 5.25, if we live in the Spirit, let us walk by the Spirit. Ephesians 5.8, you are light in the Lord, walk as children of the light. 1 Corinthians 5.7, clean out the old leaven that you may be a new batch of dough even as you are unleavened. Sanctification is the work of God, and sanctification engages the believer at every point. The ongoing pursuit without the irreversible condition is moralism, and the irreversible condition without the ongoing pursuit is antinomianism. Now here's the point that needs to be made. This sanctification that is worked in you is 100% the sovereign work of God's grace. And just for that reason, it involves a 100% spirit-enabled pursuit of every Christian. 
initiated, sustained, and consummated by the grace of God. I'll leave you with this reflection. Sanctification is something pursued in the fellowship of the church. Jesus Christ calls you to be sanctified by sitting under the means of grace, the preaching of the Word of God, the administration of the sacraments, prayer, fellowship with the saints. These are means that God has given that impart grace to you in the worship of God, in the body of Christ. And as you pursue sanctification, as you die to sin, and live to God. As you are being delivered out of this present evil age and delivered into the age to come, as the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ are being applied to you, your life is to be defined in terms of worship with those being thus delivered and thus translated. This union with Christ, as I said earlier, brings benefits of justification, adoption, and sanctification that aid you in your worship. And the worship that you must pursue is the corporate worship of God with the body of Christ each Lord's Day morning and evening, where the rhythm of those sanctified is regulated by the worship of the living and true God as the one body of Christ. The benefits of union serve not only communion with Christ, but the church's worship of the living and true God. There are other benefits that we could discuss. There are other facets of redemption applied we could consider. But what this course is designed to do is give you an overview of redemption accomplished, redemption applied in light of the teaching of the Shorter Catechism and its summary and expansion in portions of the larger catechism. You will not be free from sin and temptation in this age, but what definitive and progressive sanctification guarantees for you is that you will continue more and more to die to sin and live to God in righteousness and the struggle against sin that you experience at every point in this age is a struggle that will result in victory progressively, daily, and consummately when you are finally and fully delivered from sin in its entirety in the age to come when you are glorified. And that concludes this study and I pray the Lord will use this to aid you in your worship of God through your union and communion with Christ and the benefits of redemption that are given to you so that you might be a worshiper of the self-contained, immutable, and all-glorious triune God. Well, we hope you enjoyed uh, that final lecture uh, from Lane Tipton on Union with Christ, the benefits of his suffering and glory. The uh, course is available now online for free entirely at reformedforum.org. If you go there, you'll see at the top of the page, there's a, there's a, a menu. One of the options is Academy. And you can hover over that and either go right to the Academy page and browse what we have. You can also go to the courses part of the menu and find this course and take it. So if you're interested in that, please, if you don't have an account already, register for a free account, register for the course, take the course, but also then go forth and uh, tell other people about it. Maybe you want to do this in terms of a Sunday school and we have a, a companion book in the works. It's going to take some time, but uh, we'll also eventually have a little USB drive and we'll be able to package that with a companion book, all in a, a book package, uh, just as we've done for this Foundations of Covenant Theology course. Am I missing anything, Ryan? No, I don't think so. I, I just can't wait for the course to launch. I've, I've told so many people about it, and we have churches that are, are 
even one may already be using the curriculum and and so yes. I just I just can't wait for for people to uh, to dig in and to to drink deeply oh uh, yeah from, from the word of God and um yeah this is none of this is is inaccessible to the no. typical church sometimes people think of what we do here we, we talk about some hard stuff sometimes but I I think if you just you, you dip in and you take one of these courses it might be a little bit more advanced than what you're used to but it's not inaccessible to any buddy who's attending a confessional church, uh, any, any high schooler or adult, but I think you're going to find that it's a, it's a different pace. Like it's a different type of thing. And we love that. We think that's a good thing that this, this isn't your typical cut and dry, you know, Sunday school material, whatnot, that this is some, this is rich, but you'll learn, you'll grow. And I think it'll open your mind and your heart to, uh, to new vistas and new aspects of, of, of understanding your Bible and understanding how the Lord relates to you as one of his people. So this is just uh, the beginning. So hopefully we'll get to more of that down the road. Again, we're online at reformedforum.org. You can contact us at mail at reformedforum.org. The website also has our phone number. You can get us on Twitter, other places. So we're available for you there. But we do want to thank you for listening, and we hope you join us again next time on Christ the Center. <laughs>